Well, I'm Perry DeFontaine. Thanks so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. I usually do a couple jokes with the whole crowd, but there's no crowd to do the jokes with, so they'll sort of fall flat. Um, I'll sort of do them anyway, because uh, I am videoing this tonight, so I hope to put some of this out on the website and uh, out for people to see that can't come to the presentations. So in any case, what I would like to do is if you could hear me all the way in the back, you make a circle and please put it to your chin. I said chin, not cheek. How many did I catch? So the key is I want you to hear me tonight because I have lots of good information for you. So what I'm going to do tonight, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself because you're in for a very exciting evening. Yeah. may not be so exciting, but hopefully it'll be informative. So what I want to do tonight is show you how to use other people's money versus your money to pay for college. Sound pretty good? Too good to be true? So let's see how I do. I have lots of slides, lots of information. I'm going to go through it very, very quickly. So I'm going to rush through it. So if you can save your questions to the end, and I'll stay around if you have any questions. And I won't be offended if you get up um, and leave, OK? So it, I spent about 45 minutes to an hour going through this. So let's sort of dive in. So as a first point, a little bit about me. I have lots of information about me in the handouts and on my website. So I don't spend a lot of time talking about myself. I'll just give you a summarized few minutes of sharing you what, what I do and why I do it. So I've been spending about over 30 years in the financial services industry. About the first 20 years I spent helping multi-billion dollar corporations around the world with their money. About 15 years ago, I decided to get back to the community and help people in our community with their money, individual folks. So I opened up a practice in Jamesburg back then, and what I quickly discovered and stumbled into was the world of college planning. Now, based on my background, I'm a CPA. I did a lot of work on Wall Street. I was an investment banker. I worked at Moody's. I was a major consultant. So I usually got my licenses for securities and insurance and everything else. So it worked in the practice. But I quickly stumbled the world of college planning. And what surprised me about college planning is that it hadn't changed from when I was in high school many years ago. And here was me in high school. I was the first one in my family to go to college or thinking about going to college. Nobody else had ever done it. And basically, no information from the high school about how I was going to pay for it. We had no money. So thus began what I call my seven-year journey to get a four-year degree. I was pretty much on my own. Along the way, I found out about what I'm calling this other people's money, which is free money from the colleges. And I transferred ultimately back to Rutgers, lived on campus, got lots of free money. I graduated. I think I turned out OK. All right? So because it hadn't changed, I said, wow, this is something that I know how to do. Maybe I can help people in the community with this. And so my passion is to help families learn about this other people's money. It's surprising that people don't have this information even today. So I just want to suggest to you that because of my own experience, the opportunities in, still exist today and options for you to do the same thing. So hopefully this whole journey, and hopefully you're starting tonight, is getting educated and informed about how to do this. And that's, to me, it's all about education information. Because what's wrong, or the weakness is, the information's just not out there for the general public. So that's when you read about my, me in the national magazines, and I have some examples in your handouts. You'll see that why I have this platform, because it's just no, it really not many people know about it. So my mission is to get the word out, by word of mouth through the communities and so on and so forth that I'm in. All right, so let me at least say this. No matter what your financial situation is, I am confident that I can show you how to save thousands, even tens of thousands of dollars per year in college costs. So please stay tuned. So first off, prepare for a shop. What's the shop? Well, college is expensive no matter where you go. So here's some national statistics, but on here in locally, say in New Jersey, if you go to a public school, live on campus, and including what I call toothpaste, laundry, detergent, occasional pizza, it's going to cost you about $30,000 per year. If you go out of state, like Penn State, Delaware, Maryland, it's going to be $45,000 plus. Private schools in our area run from $35,000 to, believe it or not, over $70,000 per year. Drexel, NYU, for example. So it's lots of money per year. Multiply it by the number of kids you have, 
and it keeps going up and up and up with no end in sight. So, generally, how's a family supposed to pay for all that? Well, how many here have saved all that money? Okay, and typically in a room full of people, I speak at lots of events, I do lots of public speaking, corporations, high schools about this, people aren't raising their hand. And some of you may have saved the money, the vast majority have not. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna borrow the money, hope to get scholarships. More importantly to me, the two options on the screen, perhaps going what I call the hard way, what I mean by that is the way I started many years ago, living at home and commuting somewhere was the only option I could think of that was the cheapest way to go. So was that a good way to pick the right school for me? Maybe not. And then maybe not going at all if I'd even try to start the journey. So what I'm here to tell you is, if that's what you're thinking, okay, that should not be an option for anyone in our community. So that's why my mission is to get the word out that you should be able to find a school for your college, live on campus, get lots of money, and make it affordable no matter what your situation is. Should not be one of these two last bullets in our community. So please get the word out, pass it along. So how do you do that? I call it an ideal approach. So just so you know, in your handout, you don't have to pull it out now, but when you go home and read about it, I have a thing called an ideal approach, and I drill down and I talk about all the little boxes in here and what they mean and what the importance is. And further drilling down, say 40,000 feet down to 1,000 feet, there's just a lot more information about each one of these boxes. So what I call the ideal approach is I say there's five success factors for fundamental. So what the point is, we want to find the right school for the student where they're going to be happy. If they're happy, then more than likely they're going to be successful and get their degree in four years. You want to find the right school, they got to get into the, the schools of their choice. That's an important step. So just walking through this thing, there's a line right down the middle. Here's the student side, here's the parent side. They have the financial side, find the right school for your pocketbook, meaning maybe opportunistically uh, and optimally, you can get lots of free money from the colleges and actually make it affordable. That's what I mean, the right school for your parents. So think about the ideal approach is the right school for your child, the right school for your pocketbook, that leads to your list of right schools. Then the rest of the journey is really focusing on the process at that point. The application process and the financial aid process. Things to get through. And then ultimately using your money in the most effective way. So, the key one I want to say on this particular uh, slide and this ideal approach is you need to learn all the pieces in detail to make it all successful in a comprehensive, integrated way, in my opinion. If you mess up one of these things, it's going to cost you money. All right? So just try to make the point. Now, for sake of time tonight, I'm going to focus on the money from, to find the money, for the free money, to make, find the right scholars for the parents' pocketbook. That's what we're going to spend the time on tonight, for sake of time. And I'm also going to touch on well, how do you get the free money? You must go through the financial aid process. But recognize, I think it's important to learn about all the boxes here. I do presentations on all these different topics. So keep that in mind. So for example, just to make a point that if you miss, miss one of these, it could affect your money. Did you pick the right school for your students? So did you know that 60%, not six, 16, but 60% 60 of kids that started a four-year college never finished there? They transfer or never make it. And only 36% graduate in four years for a four-year degree. Scarier still, only 58% graduate in six years for a four-year degree. That's pretty scary. And 21% never finish at all. And if you start by going the hard way, the number that never finishes jumps to 45%. So these are all source statistics. So this will cost you money, in my opinion. How does it happen? My theory is, is kids pick the wrong school. They don't really think about, where am I going to be happy? Where am I going to be motivated? And by picking the wrong school, they end up leaving. So many of you in the community have heard stories about, if you know some peers in the community that ran off to college, and within two to three weeks, they're back home. What happened? Well, they picked the wrong school. And the colleges know the kids picked the wrong schools. There's an attrition rate. They overbooked the dorms. So many of you probably heard of kids that started in college. It's supposed to be a double. It started as a triple. Or they used the student lounge temporarily as a, a dorm room, which happened to my niece at a prestigious school here in the Northeast. So just think about the idea of this wrong school. So how do you pick the right school? Lots to learn about it. Lots of journeys to go through. 
but in simple term, you want to find the best fit for your child unique to them. Your student is unique, they need to find the right school that they're going to be happy. To show you how crazy this can be, I simply say like big, small country city. Think about that matrix. Would they be happy at a big city school or be miserable there? So oversimplified, that's part of the journey. To show you, we talk about 20 to 25 different attributes to consider, like the location of the school, is the diversity on campus, the teacher, the faculty-student ratio, all kinds of things that are important to check out. They have raw, raw football games on Saturday, I can care less, things like that. So I remember fondly one of my sons, my only child, one of his friends when he was in high school looking at colleges, what he cared about most was the food. He says, I'm going to be stuck here on this campus for four years. I want to eat good. So he cared about the food. So actually there's magazines, well books, college books, I even have them in my office that rate the, co the college campuses based on the quality of the food on campus. And by the way, those books also rate the quality of how good looking the girls are on campus or the boys are on campus if that's important to you. All right, so some of them can be a little bit silly, but where are they going to be happy and what do they care about is the important point. All right, so let's dive into the money now. How would you pay? Would you rather use other people's money versus your money? I think the answer should be obvious. So oversimplified, here's the big screen of all the things you need to learn, which are sort of buried in my ideal approach chart. So I'm just going to touch on your money. So just recognize your money. I call it a financial chessboard. All kinds of legal moves to make on your chessboard, but what are the right moves? So oversimplified, your money, I always say college planning equals retirement planning. The decisions you make today will affect your retirement tomorrow. And I also share with you, choosing a college for your kid is probably the second largest financial decision you're going to make in your lifetime next to purchasing a home. If you think about when you purchase the home, how much time and effort you put into it, most people don't spend the same time and effort figuring out how to pay the college bill. And it ends up costing them because they end up borrowing all the money and they're stuck in debt forever and ever and ever. You hear about the student debts that are going on. So just keep that in mind. So obviously you want to get other people's money first. So there's all kinds, remember I'm a CPA, good for you, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through tax strategies for college planning, but there's tons of them to learn. And free money from the tax system is what I call a tax scholarship. So it's education tax credits, tuition and fees deductions, tax advantage savings plans, all kinds of things to learn about that you should make part of your plan to get free money. Gifts, what I'm really saying is if you have rich relatives in the family, don't forget them. But I wanted to, sell, to tell you that if you do have such a situation, there's a right way to get the gift done so you can still get free money from the colleges. All right, so just recognize there's things to learn about that if that's your situation. But where I'm going to spend the time the rest of the evening is focusing on this thing called financial aid. What I call the best kept secret in America. Lots of money, now pushing 300 billion. This is from a few years ago. It's over 300 billion per year in financial aid available. The key is knowing where and how to get it. So here's what I call this aid pie. And this big green sliver, okay, is actual government loans, federal government loans. So just so you know, if you're in the audience, you have no idea, you haven't saved the money, have no idea where the money's gonna come from to pay for college, the government will let you borrow $70,000 per year to send your child to Drexel or NYU if you want to. And you just have to have okay credit to do it. Five minutes online, they'll authorize you to get the $70,000 loan. So just so you know, for some of you, that might make you feel you can sleep at night knowing that that's available to you. But what I spend the time talking about is free money, not loans. So I, everything, when I say the words financial aid, please think Perry's talking free money, not loans. Okay, that's what I think financial aid should be. So an interesting couple of highlights on the chart, the free money part. Believe it or not, the colleges themselves have the most free money, not the government and not private scholarships. In fact, private scholarships are this little tiny blue sliver right here that most families chase after, those national private scholarships. Thousands of applicants to get one scholarship, right? I'll touch on that a little bit more later. So think of it as a theoretical time allocation decision. Do I want to spend time going to private scholarships or maybe learning how to get the free money from the colleges because that's the largest free money slice, the colleges themselves, which is free money. And on the government side, 
the free money. If you're a family of four and you make more than $50,000 per year, you aren't getting any free government money for college. That's just the fact, okay? And I'll touch on it a little bit later. The other thing that's important about this chart is 90% of what you see represented on this chart, the colleges themselves are the gatekeepers of all that money. So what that means is you must go through what I call the financial aid process, completing ugly looking financial aid forms, et cetera, in order to get access to this pie. All right, so just keep that in mind as well. And we're gonna dive into this in more detail. So, federal government. The free money program they have available is something called Pell Grants, that's a major piece. In order to get it, as I said, you pretty much have to be hardly earning any money. So if you want a Pell Grant, which is roughly $5,000 to $5,500 per year in free money, you need to be a family of four making $10,000 or less per year. If you're making 30 to 40, you might get a few hundred dollars in a Pell Grant. Other than that, you're getting zero, right? So that's the free money program federal government that everybody talks about, the politicians. It may not be for most of you in this room. Work study simply means an on-campus job. The government allocates money to college. It's a part-time job, okay? And typically seven to 12 hours per week is designed to give them a paycheck for basically toothpaste, laundry detergent, occasional pizza. It's really not designed to pay a college bill. Right? So again, that's not gonna be a big part of your solution. And then they have these loans. So, first thing I wanna mention is the Stafford loan. That's a loan for the students in their name by themselves without a parent as a co-signer. 5,500 per year, maximum as a freshman. Jumps to 6,500 sophomore, 7,500 junior, senior, and beyond. So, the key thing is that loan, the student can get by themselves without a co-signer. Now, just to tie this together briefly, because I may forget to say this later, in order to get a Stafford loan, you must complete a FAFSA form. If you don't complete a FAFSA form, they won't offer you the Stafford loan. So it's a government requirement that you fill out their form to get this loan, okay? Oh, by the way, the loan is deferred till they leave school. So they defer the payments, all right? So just keep that in mind. Um, and that's it, the Perkins loan quickly, that's if you have extreme need in the system, really low poverty level, they'll give you a supplemental loan. That's also deferred while the student leaves school in their name by themselves, typically for a couple of thousand dollars. For most people in our community, you're never gonna get a Perkins loan, so just keep that in mind. The PLUS loan is that parent loan program I was mentioning earlier, that big green sliver. Okay, you can get a loan called a federal PLUS loan that's in the parent's name, one of the parent's signs for the loan directly. It's a typical 10-year payback, and you can borrow $70,000 if you have okay credit. The, the payments start spring of freshman year. They expect you to start paying the loan back. It's a standard 10-year payback, right? But if you have no other option, at least you know that loan's available. It's not my favorite move on the chessboard, but be aware that that's an option in case you have no other options. And you want to borrow the money. That's pretty much it for the government. In New Jersey, they have their own free money program, the tuition aid grant program is the big one. Very similar to that Pell Grant in that family of four, 50,000 or more here in New Jersey, you're not getting a tuition aid grant. Oh, by the way, the tuition aid grant, if you get them, you can only use it at a New Jersey college or university. You can't take it out of state. So again, more than likely, most people won't be getting that. They do have uniquely these class loans. This New Jersey class loan is their college loan program. By the way, I should have mentioned the PLUS loan and the New Jersey class. These are loans that are not available to the general public. So most people don't know about these loans. The point is, is if you have a child going to college, then you have access to these loans. So not, when you go apply for these loans, it's very easy to apply. It's not like you go through the normal banking mortgage process. We have to provide documents and so on. You just go online and they check your credit score, you get it or you don't get it. So just want you to know the process of getting them has been very, very easy. And if you talk to friends, family, and neighbors, they won't know about them because they're, unless they have kids in school. All right, so I just want to make that point. What's interesting about New Jersey class loans, they have a loan that's similar to the PLUS loan, but at a better rate. The PLUS loan is fixed about 6.8%, 10 year payback. The New Jersey class loan is about 4.6, 4.7 fixed. So much better financial option if you're gonna end up borrowing money as a parent. The other thing that's interesting about New Jersey class loan, they also have a loan that you put the student's name, primarily responsible with a co-signer, and defer the loan to 
for when they leave school. So that's another fund. So some different variations in New Jersey class versus the federal government loan is only in the parent's name for the big money. So just planting some seeds there that there might be some moves on your financial chessboard down the road. Keep in mind that I want to emphasize the free money though tonight. Okay, some other states I speak at locally, I'll skip them. Private, over that small sliver, only about one to two percent of the aid pie. Lots of scams out there. Hey, give me money, I guarantee I'm gonna find you this free money in a scholarship, right? So is it really worth it? I think it rhetorically think of it as a time allocation decision. We don't ignore private scholarships, but we want to focus on getting the, the big chunk of the free money which comes from the colleges themselves. So a couple resources. The high school guidance department here should have this information too, but the nas big national private scholarship search engine is something called FastWeb, F-A-S-T-W-E-B, which is free. And that's pretty much, check and see if there's some low hanging fruit there. If not, I would say seriously, don't spend your time chasing after those crumbs. Instead, I say focus on more local scholarships if you're gonna do private scholarships. Check with the high school guidance department here, see what local scholarships they have available. Think about your churches, synagogues, and mosques. Think about clubs and associations in the area, what scholarship, and don't forget your employers. Some of you work for some corporations that offer scholarships to kids. The whole opportunity about thinking local is the odds of getting them are greater. Make sense, just logically? Okay. Um, that leads right into this college piece, that big sliver of the pie where all the free money is, where Perry believes what you should focus on, right? So they have what are called endowments. That's money that alumni get back to the school, but they love their college experience so much, they end up being successful, they give back to the colleges. Believe it or not, the top, there's about 3,000 plus, depending on how you measure colleges and universities in the United States, the top 120 ranked by endowments has 411 billion with a B in endowment money. The top thousand schools on average have 500 million in endowment money. No government strings attached. They're free to do what they want with that money and the vast majority of them use it in the form of attracting people to their campus with financial aid. That's where your huge opportunity is, in my opinion. Lots of myths about this thing called financial aid. I have made too much money, my kids' grades are too low, okay, and it's easy to get the money, right? So I'll let you determine based on what I go through tonight if you think it's gonna be easy to get this money. And if it was easy, you probably wouldn't be here and everybody would know how to do it. Food for thought. The reality is the colleges, it's a big, big business. Somebody figured out a long time ago, if I go to college for C-level high school students, I can make lots of money. So there's lots of colleges. They have lots of money to give. They want to fill the seat. I call it, it's like the analogy like buying a car. Okay, they want to sell the car. In this case, they want to sell a seat. So they can sell the seat for a discount they sold it versus having an empty seat. So just think of the logic of that for a minute. Interesting statistic, 84% or so of students attending private colleges, the ones with the big scary sticker prices, remember, receive free money and the average discount is 40% off the sticker price. So maybe sticker price doesn't matter. So I'm going to introduce the concept of what I call true cost. True cost equaling the sticker price minus the free money equals true cost. So options and opportunities, planting a seed for now. Hey, maybe there's something to what Perry's talking about, these colleges that have money. However, in my opinion, it's complex and confusing. That's why I'm here to try to give you some education information to start your journey. So how do they determine this? Well, first thing I do is look the financial aid, the free money I'm talking about is between what I call need-based aid and non-need-based aid. So let me start with need-based aid first. Based on a formula, Department of Education, cost of attendance of a school, that sticker price including toothpaste, laundry detergent, occasional pizza, minus something called an expected family contribution equals need. That's this formula, so let me just go through it. I mentioned the cost of attendance. Okay, they go to University of Hawaii, including the official cost of attendance is transportation to get them back and forth to Hawaii. It's whatever's gonna come out of your pocket for your child to go get a student for the year. Here's the hard part. The expected family contribution, I call it the black box. What it is, is essentially the, you put in all your income and assets on forms that are submitted to processors, 
they put it to the black box, EFC calculators, and out spits a number that says, here's what you are expected to contribute per year towards your child's education relative to your neighbor countrywide. Trust me, if you go online and fill in these forms, you'll be shocked at the numbers. It'll be a lot more than you think you can afford. Right? So I just want you to understand it's a black box. But it's a system of allocation based on need. An interesting stat, okay? If you, I guess it's a 2013 tax returns. So when you hear this, it's going to blow your mind. The top 10% of people that file tax returns in the United States, top 10%, their adjusted gross income was 130,000 or more. So if you think about allocation in this system, okay, if you're making more than 130,000, you're going to be the top 10% of people that are expected to pay for college in this system of allocation. But just recognize that as a starting point. That's why people think I make too much money, I'm never going to get this financial aid. So, and to make it more confusing, there's two popular methodologies. One's called the federal formula, one's called the institutional formula. You see, federal is used by all the government entities to give out their money. Generally, the vast majority of public colleges and universities use this formula to give out their money and some private student. The good news, it does not assess home equity. What does that mean? Well, if you have most people I meet in the college planning business, parent high school kids, or what I call equity rich and cash poor, that all their money is tied up in their houses. So what I mean by equity is the value of your house minus any debt equals equity. Good news, it's not counted. It's good, it won't hurt you. And they use something called a FAFSA form to collect the information. Versus what's called the institutional methodology, that's the black box that's used by all those private schools to give out their money. Remember, no government strings attached. They got their own system. So, one big difference in their black box versus the federal black box is they do count home equity against you. And they also use something called a profile form. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And, so let me just try to give you a snapshot. So let's say your, your expected family contribution was $30,000. What does that mean? Well, the context here is, well, how does it relate to the cost of the school? So if I look at school A, and the cost of attendance is $30,000. So let's call it Rutgers for fun. Rutgers has a sticker price of $30,000. If your family's EFC is $30,000, your need is zero. So what that means is at Rutgers, you will not be eligible for need-based aid at Rutgers University. Does that make sense? Got it? However, the difference is, if you're looking at school B, okay, same EFC, just same forms went in, spits out your respective family contribution, the variable here is not your EFC is the cost of the school. So the cost of the school is college B is $60,000. Let's call it a private school with a big sticker price of $60,000. Your EFC is thirty. dollars Your need is $30,000. And if college B met your need 100% with essentially all free money, you're going to college B for $30,000. How much are you going to be spending to go to college A? $30,000. So all of a sudden, if you see that, what it means to me, if your budget happened to be thirty thousand, you're willing to send your kid to Rutgers or College of New Jersey or Stockton or Montclair. I just don't know the whole audience, but say that that's true. Well, you don't just limit the schools based on sticker price. You can open up a whole universe of schools that you didn't think you could afford. They're going to cost the same cost or less as a public school in New Jersey. That's the first thing I want you to grasp as a parent. Why is that important to me? My passion is I'm here to do this for your kids. Now they have more schools to pick from. Increase the odds they can find the right school for them where they're going to be happy and graduate in four years, dot, dot, dot. You can see how that all sort of ties together. Okay, good. So let's keep going fast. Um, let's see, make sure. So great, Gary, I got this. How do I get more of this need-based aid? How do I get this? Well, I call it a financial aid game. Remember, like any game when you were a child, Call it shoots and ladders and candy land. If you didn't know the rules, what happened with your friends? You probably lost. They took advantage of you, right? So the point is you want to learn the rules of how to play the game. So I call it a game, and I'm focusing on the black box, the EFC. So think of it as loopholes. And I use the word loopholes on purpose. It sounds sinister and bad. And I want to make the analogy to what I'm going to call, remember as a CPA, tax loopholes. So let's think about this scenario. Debt, okay? 
So what we call in the financial business, there's good debt and bad debt. Okay, bad debt would be credit card debt. One of the reasons we don't like credit card debt as a, fin as a financial advisor, as a CPA, is because the interest on the debt is not tax deductible. So you pay whatever the interest rate is, and that's what it is. Whereas good debt, which would be like a home equity line, we call them HELOCs, or a cash out refinance or a mortgage, the interest is tax deductible. So keeping that in mind, if you have a lot of credit card debt and you met a financial advisor or a CPA, what strategy they may mention to you, or you might have read about it yourself, is something called a debt consolidation. You consolidate all the credit card debt, you get money from a home equity line of credit, typically a lower interest rate, especially after taxes, you pay off all the credit cards, fresh start. All right? So if you made that move, which is pretty popular, most of you have done that over your lifetimes, was that illegal? Unethical? Immoral? No. Just knowing the rules. That's why I'm going to make the analogy for you with the black box. Okay? The EFC. So let's assume you're a family of four. These are real numbers. Keep in mind that generally there's going to be categories where you sort of fit in boxes, but everybody's situation is unique. They have multiple different family members, different itemized scheduled deductions, so just recognize the black box is not really simple, but just recognize you are a family of four, made $85,000 per year, and had assets slash net worth of $900,000. Many would say, I'm never getting any financial aid. So let me just show you how this works in the, in the need-based system. So as a starting point, let's say your initial expected family contribution, filling out the forms, was roughly 32, 33,000, based on where your assets were and your income. Right? I'm going to round that to 30,000 to make the discussion easier to follow. So if you have a 30,000 EFC, remember that prior slide. Depending on the college, I can get need-based aid, and some schools I can't. Okay? So depending on what your budget is, that may be good, it may be bad. Hey, I only can spend 10,000, I'm not going to get any need-based aid. This ain't so good. Okay? So it depends on your situation. But let's assume through repositioning strategies, learning how the system works, you reduce the EFC down to 9,000 to 12,000, rounding to 10,000, which by the way doesn't include quitting your job. Okay, so you're still at 85,000 of income. So that means at 10,000, what does that change? Remember before college A, I had no need. Well, now my EFC is 10, 30 minus 10. I have need of $20,000 at college A. I'm now eligible for need based aid at college A up to $20,000. A huge difference. College B, 60 minus 30 was 30, now it's 60 minus 50, your EFC 10, 60 minus 10, need is 50. Instead of being eligible for only 30,000 of need based aid at College B, you're eligible for 50,000. And again, imagine they meet your need 100% with free money. You're getting 50,000 in free money, you're going for $10,000 to College B. Huge difference. So, one rhetorical question. Well, Perry, what strategies are you talking about? So let me give you an example of one, all right? So I'm gonna pick on you over here. I don't have much to pick on, okay? Pick on you over here. You save $40,000 for college, and you're gonna use it for your student during the college years. That's your plan, okay? So you have $40,000 in an account that's in your name, right? You, sir, have the same thing. That's your plan you're gonna use for college, right? So, let's assume you have a great financial advisor that can get 10% return on that money, just to make the math simple. 10%, so you got $4,000 of what I'm gonna call a little bit of techno babble here, ordinary income for tax purposes, if you understand that term. So I have $4,000 in ordinary income for tax purposes. Uncle Sam wants a piece of that action. If you're in a marginal tax bracket of 25%, 25% of 4,000 ordinary income equals $1,000 in taxes, federal taxes. So after tax, 3,000. Not so bad, right? Okay, pretty happy. So you, sir, you meet a financial advisor or a CPA, you read this in a magazine article, hey, you know what, I could show you a way to get rid of that $1,000 in taxes. Instead, keep $1,000 for yourself. So that popular move is to basically create an account that you become the custodian of and put it in your student's name as the owner of the account. We call it custodial account, an UGMA, an UGMA, some of these you have. So by making that move, let's say opportunistically, you've, you've saved a thousand dollars in taxes, okay? By making that move. You, sir, never met an advisor that showed you that strategy, you never read the magazine article, you're stuck at the three thousand dollars. 
pay an income per year after tax. Let's fast forward and complete the financial aid forms. So now I want you to think of the logic of the black box. If the colleges see money in the student's name, what do you think they think about that money? What they think about it is that's money for us. So in the black box, that's the most heavily assessed asset in the black boxes is money in the students' names. So depending on the black box, it should be how complicated is one black box assesses at 20 cents on the dollar, the other one 25. I'm gonna use the 25 to make the math simple. $40,000 in the student's name, you follow the form and the instructions, you don't know the consequences of this move, you just follow the instructions to put things in the right boxes. Hey, that's a student asset, I'm gonna put it in that box. 40,000 times 25%, you basically have an EFC charge of $10,000 per year by having that in the kid's name. You, sir, it's a parent asset. You put it in the right box. They treat parent assets more favorably than student assets. Depending on the box, box it's 5 to 6%, depending on all kinds of things. Let's go with 5 to make the math simple. 40,000 times 5 is a $2,000 EFC charge. A difference of $8,000. Is that fair? They're both using it for the same purposes. They're both gonna use it during the college years to pay college bills. So legally it's different, but strategically you're gonna both do the same thing. Is that fair? Well, if you don't think it's fair, hey, I'd rather have the $2,000 charge than the $10,000 charge. The strategy would be get it out of your kid's name, put it back in the parent's name, you just reduced your EFC $8,000, and you give up the $1,000 in tax savings. So you make a decision that that's a better move. Now, first of all, don't run out and cash out all your kids' accounts, based on what I just said. It depends on your situation. So full disclosure, don't go do that. You want to find out that move makes sense. So, just so you know, that move is basically strategy three, right there. Okay, so above board legal moves by knowing how this black box works. So I just want to give you an example of one, okay, just to show you how this works. It's not some sinister thing, we're hiding money in the Cayman Islands or something crazy. All right, good. So some of you are gonna to react to this and say, hey Perry, I make 150,000, this is not for me. So family four, 150,000, net worth 750, here's their initial EFC with wherever the assets are by doing repositioning, learning the loopholes, and strategizing this out, moves on a chessboard, they reduce their EFC to 25 to 30, let's just make it 30 for fun, well, now all of a sudden, if they have a school they're interested in that costs more than $30,000, they are now eligible for need-based aid at that school, where previously at these numbers, they're not. So a huge opportunity, depending on your budget and what kind of schools you're interested in. Get that a little bit? So I want to just tell you, $150,000, you can get tens of thousands of dollars per year from colleges from the need-based system. Most of you never think that that's possible. So what I want to at least plant the seed for now is everybody that's here should want to find out what's my possibility? What's my EFC? Can I get it to a number that makes it sense to me for, for me to go get all this free money from the need-based system? So I just want to plant the seed that I think all of you should want to at least learn that for yourself. What's that opportunity? And what's it all going to mean? Some of you are going to say, I make 300,000. This isn't for me. So remember, I'm going to say EFC, or my EFC is, the F in EFC is family, not per child. So some of you planned and had your kids exactly four years apart and are proud of yourselves. You're going to cry in a minute because those of you that sit in the audience said, I have twins. What am I going to do? In the system, the EFC gets split apart between the two kids and they each have their own piece. So imagine if it's a 300,000 income per child is 25 to 30,000. Wow. Okay, so just so you know. So everyone should want to find out. Let me find out if any of this is possible for me. Because just so you know, in the system, need-based aid is the biggest chunk of the free money pie. So you want to find out if this is possible for you, in my opinion. And oh, by the way, my brother-in-law, he has triplets. And he's an orthodontist. Right? So think about his income. Triplets. EFC, they got need-based aid going to college. All right? So depends on your situation. All right. Great, Perry. I got this whole EFC. Find out what's possible for me. What does this all mean? So if I get college A from, call it Rutgers, 30,000 sticker price, EFC 10, I have need of 20 for Rutgers, they're giving me $20,000, right? No. 
The next step is you have to figure out which schools have money, which ones don't. So some schools meet need 100% and some don't. So we gotta record this. Remember I told you this is not easy in my opinion. So wouldn't you wanna know that before you apply? Depending on your situation? I would think so. And further, some schools meet your need, but how do they meet it? Do they meet it with free money? What I call gift aid? Scholarship, you don't have to pay them back? Or they meet it with what I call self-help? Hey, congratulations, we give you $50,000 in financial aid, it's all loans. You want the free money, not the loans. Okay, or an on-campus job. So you want to know that. Which schools have money, which ones don't? Which ones get more need-based aid if this is you? Okay? And as a general rule, private schools have more money than public schools. Choose your college wisely. Generally, what I found is most people in this community can go to private schools for cheaper than the public schools in New Jersey. Bottom line. So that's what you want to learn. How is that possible for my situation? You further need to understand what the school aid policy is at the school. Some schools have give lots of need-based aid, some schools don't. So statistics could be misleading. I'm gonna give you an example later to tell you how arbitrary this is, but just recognize what's the school's business policy. It's business policy, marketing policy, financial aid policy, all linked together. You need to know that. So how do you do this? I call it a matrix. How do you find the right school? So the matrix is unique to each family. So these poor folks have already met with me, so they know what the matrix is. But the matrix is, think about it, unique, your student. What's unique about your student? It's their grades, it's their scores on the tests, it's their major. Also, I would like to respectfully suggest, what's the right school, big, small country, city? What kind of school do they like? Okay, what's unique to you as parents? Well, how much do you want to spend? Your budget. And the other piece is, what's my financial situation? Depending on my financial situation, what kind of aid can I get? Can I get need-based aid or not? So once you have all these factors, you, there's a, a solution for you. Here's a list of schools that solves your unique matrix. From my experience, the only matrix I cannot solve for families in our community is if you have a D slash F student and your budget zero. Any other combination, there's schools that solve your matrix. So your budget's $10,000, you have a, a B student, tons of schools you can find to make this work. And that's what you want to do, is go on the journey and, and learn how to do that. All right. So, let's assume your EFC is ten dollars to $15,000. So to make it, just show you solving the matrix, and imagine there's a, a database of all the schools countrywide, sorted by most free money, more free money, average for the other money, last least, for this unique situation. And to condense it, here's a snapshot. So say your EFC is 10, you have one common example. Family of four, 85,000 per year, their EFC is $10,000. What's the best school for them? What I would call a private, 100% need-based school, that meets your need 100% with essentially all free money. That's their policy, okay? All means for everyone that gets into the school. So if that's your situation, all means if they're the last one accepted at the school, one before the waiting list, the school guarantees they will meet your need 100%. How good is that? It's huge. So I just wanna point out, if this is your situation, there's a right school to save you the most money. Just to give you an example, the other side of it. 100% need-based school, but they give less than 100% need-based. They don't have a policy that means that they have lots of need-based aid, but they don't give it to everybody. That's what that means, okay? Then they're gonna allocate it. Who would they allocate it to logically? They're gonna allocate it to the ones they want the most. So the bottom 25 percentile means they're at the bottom of the freshman applicants at that school. If that's their policy and this is you, you're not gonna get any free money. You're stuck at sticker price. Does that make sense? A little bit, but it's a little bit overwhelming. But I just want you to see, you wanna find this school, not that school. Even though the, the, the school will tout their endowment, they got this and that, statistics can be misleading. You gotta know what their policy is, all right? Now, just to compare to a public school in New Jersey for fun, wow, I'm gonna get lots of free money from Rutgers. My kid's a top student, so on and so forth. Well, what I'm saying is, if you're top 5% of the applicants at Rutgers, yeah, you get lots of money. Not need-based, but it's gonna be merit money. Okay, 
Okay, because they don't have lots of money. So I'm going to paint a picture. Top 5%, public school in New Jersey, lots of money. Less than 5%, the bottom, less than the bottom 95%, you get zero. Like a cliff. That's what I'm representing here. You. You're stuck at sticker price for you're not top 5% public school in New Jersey, a public school out of state, New Jersey, like Penn State, Delaware, Maryland. You get nothing. So if you just look at that, wow, I need to find those. Make sense so far? Okay, good. Now, what if I make too much money? This is great, pair the need base. No matter what you tell me, I'm never going to get into this need base aid. You're wasting my time. Remember what I said earlier. No matter what your financial situation, there's ways to get thousands, tens of thousands of dollars per year in college, free money. So what you want to focus on getting non-need-based aid. So I'm going to emphasize what I call tuition discounts. But just to mention, most of you know this term called merit. If I have a top 5% applicant, straight-A student, plenty of schools that you're going to get merit money. Okay? So most of you know that. But I'm here to tell you there's lots of more other money out there that they'll call merit. I call it non-need-based aid. I say tuition discounts. So let me give you an example right here locally. So you can verify what I'm telling you to be true. I'm going to use Monmouth University. Most of you have heard of it here in New Jersey. Their policy, you call them up, I want to make up, make up your student. Call up on purpose say, I have a B student, 550 each section of the SAT. I met this crazy guy, Perry, who told me no matter how much money I make, a millionaire, whatever it is, you're going to give me free money. They'll tell you right over the phone, yes, we will. We'll give you 10 to 14 off the sticker price, please apply. And sticker price is in the low 40s. That's what I mean by this non-need-based data. So you can verify what I'm telling you to be true just calling up a local school. So it's all about knowing what the school's financial aid policies are. That's the key, all right? So if that's, this, that's the situation I'm describing here. So you've got to find schools like that. So again, assuming you have your EFC is so high, you're never going to get need-based aid is the point of that slide. It's a different list, different order. Most more, okay? Just to condense it, 100% need-based, that's the worst one for this situation. Let me explain why. School that's 100% need-based as a policy, I call it need or bust. They don't give any merit money, zero. So you have a top applicant going to one of those schools and you assume they're going to get all this money, but this is their policy and this is you, you're getting zero. They don't give any merit money at all. It's all need-based. So in that case, that would be the worst choice. The other one, that was the best choice. So what you want is these schools that give tuition discounts to keep it simple, top 5%. This is their policy, lots of money. The key is, remember I said public school, it's a cliff. Top 5% money, not top 5% zero. The private schools with lots of money that have this policy, top 5% lots of money, then it's a slope. So if you're in the middle of the pack, like that, you're still getting lots of money, like a mom. So just give you an example how that works. All right, public school in New Jersey, stuck at sticker price. Okay, that's nothing to do with it. It's basically top 5% money, if not, you get nothing. They don't have money at the public schools. All right. So, just back to this quickly. Let me give you one example show you how arbitrary. Let's say your student was interested in looking at colleges in Washington, D.C. You poor people have heard this example probably too many times. But anyway, so I'll just share it. So if they're interested in Washington, D.C., you do some research, find out, well, the, probably the best two schools in Washington, generic, just rank, based on rankings, is Georgetown and George Washington. You check out the sticker prices, they're both, let's say, $60,000 plus. So just make it $60,000 for discussion. You cringe a little bit, but you say, hey, you know what, they want to go check out Washington, let's go take a drive and check out the schools. So you go down there, you visit Georgetown. Then they're going to trot out the financial aid folks, they say something like this. 70% of the freshmen receive financial aid, and the 70%, and the average free money is $30,000. What did you just hear? Hey. My kid's average gets in here, I'll get 30,000, I can go for 30,000. George Washington hears something similar. That's what you hear, you drive home in the car, you discuss it, did we hear that right? That's what you heard? Hey, go ahead and apply, all right? That may be possible. So here's the trick. If this is you, okay, remember the financial aid policy, and your child applies to Georgetown, 
Okay, you heard the same thing from both schools, statistics, which are all true, by the way, but the difference is the financial aid policy. That's what I'm leading you to here. They go to Georgetown, they apply to Georgetown. So Georgetown, if you don't know, the application to go to Georgetown is lots of stuff. It's not a Rutgers application. Name, address, phone number, get your scores, new transcripts, you're done. Georgetown, you get to do essays. You get to do interviews. You get to do three additional standardized tests besides the SAT or the ACT. That's the requirement. So your kids figure it out, do all this work. They get into Georgetown, they get the thick envelope versus what I call the thin envelope. The thick envelope means congratulations, you got in. Here's your housing options. Here's your dining options. Here's when the orientation's going to be. Here's the tickets. The thin envelope, regrets you're not accepted, right? In case you don't know that. So now you got the thick envelope. Now you're waiting for that financial aid package, and you expect, hey, you know, we're at least going to get that average 30000 You open it up, you get a big whopping free money of zero. What happened? You call them up. What happened to average 30? Oh, you didn't have any need because you're here. Our policy is 100% need based. You get nothing. Surprise. That's what you want to learn up front. By the way, across the street, a few streets. George Washington. Different policy. Who are they competing with? Georgetown. So they have a policy. They're generous with need based aid, but they also give tuition discounts. So their trick there is if you knew that up front and you wanted your budget to be, say, $30,000, you are never going to spend sixty dollars to go to Georgetown. George Washington's a perfect alternative for you because financially they give tuition discounts. So you can go and get knocked twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 off the sticker price. What do you think from a business perspective? Those in the know, George Washington attracts perfectly bright students, great George Washington, world-renowned law school, world-renowned medical school, world-renowned business school. Nothing wrong with George Washington. Bottom line, academically on a par. But you can save lots of money by going to George Washington versus Georgetown. Why not? If that's your interest. And as long as your kid will be happy there, right? Okay. So I just want to point that out. Good. So that's how the option, options and opportunities to get free money, find the right school. How do you get the free money? Now I'm going to segue. You've got to ask for it. So segue to the financial aid form process. Believe it or not, more than half of the parents countrywide never apply for financial aid. They never ask. It's amazing, but true. So please, if you get anything from tonight, go ask for it. Fill out those financial aid forms. So what do you have to do? You have a FAFSA form. You have a FAFSA form. So I'm just holding one up in case you don't know. So lots of pages. Lots of boxes, lots of fine print. You got to get through it. Okay. So the key thing to understand is a FAFSA form. So you look at the things I have on the screen. Lots of this is government studies. Ninety percent go into errors, inconsistencies, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. Okay. As I suggested earlier, if you don't apply, then they don't give you the financial aid. So you got to get through it. All right. So. Now, let me segue to the profile form. The profile form, what I'll hold up, they don't have a standard pre-printed one, but this is a pretty much a vanilla one. I call it 14 pages of fun. So 14 pages. But they give you instructions, seven pages of fine print. So just be aware what you're up against. All right? The key thing, why is it so much more involved? Because, for example, on the FAFSA form, they're going to ask for one year's worth of income, on the profile, they ask for three. They ask much more detailed questions about your stuff. They ask about who owns the cars in the family. So I want you to think about this. Your child turns 16, you buy them a shiny new car. What do you think the colleges think about that? That money was for us. They're going to penalize you for it. So just things to be aware of on the forms. Just a lot more involved, a lot more detailed. Why? Because they can. It's their system, their money, no strings attached. So just recognize that that's the case. Okay. Now, and on top of that, the schools that have all the money, they have their own forms too. So let's think about this. Different questions, but the core of the forms, they're going to ask the same things. What did you make? How much money you got in the bank? How much you got in brokerage accounts? They ask the same questions three times. Why would they do that? I usually ask the audience to participate. Anybody want to take a shot? Why would they ask you three times the same question? Anybody want to take a guess? 
You're still awake? Different answer, but meaning what? What's the consequence? You lied. They got you. Very good. They got you. And got you mean, I call it the red flags. You want to avoid red flags. You want to tell the truth and be consistent on the forms. But what most families do, they delegate it to their kids. The kids don't know how to complete the form. They have cash in bank. They make up a number. Let's call it 10000 then three weeks later, they get the call home up and say, hey, you forgot to complete this form. They get another form, they ask the cash question again. They write down 100,000. What do you think the college thinks? They lie or whatever. So now what happens, the red flag, the colleges have the right to go ask you to prove your numbers. They're gonna ask you for copies of bank statements, brokerage accounts, on and on and on. So you wanna avoid the red flags. So consistency and to get you. The other one's tougher. Okay, just me thinking out of the box. What will be another time they reason they ask you three times the same questions. If you guys get this, you're really good and you're really awake. So I don't expect you to get it. Basically, so you give up. Think about it. So I find there's two constituencies out there in the general public. Those that think it's easy, fill out the FAFSA form for free, it's simple. If you find people that say that to you, find out what their results are. If they get good results, latch onto them and ask them for help, because then they're probably pretty good, okay? But the other constituency, you'll never get money in the financial aid system. Don't bother completing the forms. So I'm here to tell you, okay, that little voice whispers in your ear when you're trying to complete the forms, please get through the process, ask for the money, it pays off. So you wanna make sure you get through the process that they try to put you off. All right, now on top of that, if you own a business, own a, have a farm, divorced or separated, you get to do more forms. So I just want you to know, lots of forms, lots of forms. This is what the process is all about. Now, great, I complete all the forms. What if I make a mistake? So remember I used the $40,000 example before, you understood the student's asset versus the parent's asset? So here's, there's lots of mistakes people make. So here's a, a good one, I'm gonna give you a freebie here. So imagine something called a 529 plan. So if you don't know what that is, it's a tax advantage college savings plan. You put the money in there, and if you use the money taken out to pay college bills, any earnings you have in the account are tax-free, okay, in case you don't know what it is. So it's literally for college spending. If you don't use it for college spending, you're penalized. So the money's basically dedicated to your student to pay college bills. So let's make a choice. It's either a student asset or a parent asset. How many would say it's a student asset? So half the crowd might raise, would raise their hand. How many think it's a parent asset? Half the crowd. Half the crowd made an $8,000 mistake because it's actually treated as a parent asset. Okay, that's what, the, now when they first came out, they were all over the map, but they all reached a consensus, we're gonna treat it as a parent asset. But that's a mistake, if you make that mistake, it will cost you, and how would you know if you made a mistake or not? So you wanna make sure that you don't cost yourselves money by making those mistakes. So when do you apply? Now I'm gonna give you the standard information, I'm gonna give you one interesting caveat that just occurred. Let me stick with the standard. So these would be common rhetorical answers that people would make, they're all wrong. So here's my golden rule. For every school you're gonna to apply to, because every school has their own forms, their own process, it's not standard. Every school you're gonna to apply to, you must find out what their financial aid process is, what forms they require, what are their deadlines, and do not miss them. That's the golden rule. So if you don't think about this, these are logical answers. So for example, why beginning of January senior year? So if you're an upcoming senior this fall, you're a senior, okay? you will find out that you can't do a FAFSA form until January 1st of 2017. You can't even get access to the system. So if that's all you learn about financial aid, hey, I can wait till January. Guess what those private schools do with their own forms and their own deadlines? Different forms, different deadlines are earlier than that. If you do early decision, they can require a profile as early as October 1st of this year. And if you miss that deadline, when they give out their money, you wait till January when you do a FAFSA form, Sorry, you missed our deadline. So just give me a practical example of why these would be wrong. Sure, how do you get accepted by a school, Why? Right? No, they do it pretty much in parallel. Okay, so again, you don't want to miss the deadlines. Is the point. Well, of course, after my tax returns. Now, why do I use that as an example? Because on the FAFSA form for next year, okay, this has been up for all, we've been doing this for 15 years. It's been the same for 15 years. Okay, hey, 2016 would be the year that matters if you're a senior next year, okay? So I can't, you know, they refer. Box A comes from your 2016 tax return. When are you gonna get the tax return done? 
How many of you actually even get done by April 15, 2017? Well, you'll miss all the deadlines. So what you have to do is do estimates on the forms. And how many here can do their tax return on a cocktail napkin without W-2s? Some of you can. Be proud. But if you can't, you just make sure you've got to get the forms on the deadlines, including doing estimates. Okay? So that's why these are all wrong. Don't miss the deadlines. Now, I just explained everything. It's the way it's been for 15 years. Now, to make it more complicated for you poor juniors, if you, I think you're a junior, right? Good. Going into your senior year, the federal government just came up with this new thing. I don't know if you've even caught it in the news. It just got agreed to about a month ago. The FAFSA form for 2017, they will allow you, they're only going to ask you for 2015 tax information, your actual tax return. They're not going to ask about 2016. So everything I just described won't apply to the FAFSA next year. Sounds good, right? One little problem. The private schools haven't changed their rules. So now you have more complications. You still got to do the estimates, you still got to do this, you got to do that. So I just want to point out that maybe the private schools will catch up and say, well, we're just going to use last year's tax return. That will change this whole thing. You just can use last year's actual. But just, you know, the private schools, they ask for actual, this year's estimated, and next year forecasted. They're looking for three years. So I just wanted to point that out to you in case you go home and say, well, no, I, I just heard the FAFSA form is going to be easy because you can use 2015 for next year. Okay, I want to make sure you heard that. So the other thing I just want to put down the home stretch, just so you guys know. The other thing I want you to realize, and I don't spend a lot of time tonight on it, you can negotiate with the schools. Where do you think you'd have the most chance of success in negotiating? A public school in New Jersey or a private school with lots of money? Just common sense. So I make the analogy like buying a car. Okay? You can haggle with the dealer because they're selling the seat. So the private schools have lots of money. We found lots of success in having to negotiate. The key is knowing how to do it, what to ask respectfully, and how to make it work. So just realize another opportunity to get more free money. What are your options from here? Point is, you've begun your education information journey. How do you learn more? How do you actually get help if you say, I need help to get through this process? But at least at this point, think more about getting educated and informed. How do I continue the journey of learning more for my unique situation? So think about this list of people. Clearly the high school can help you. The reason they have me here to be candid because they really can't help you with the financial stuff. That's why they asked me to come. But don't, they're still a resource to you, okay? So just realize that. But just think about the list here. Well, what do they know about college stuff? So the one thing I want to introduce is the idea of a college planning specialist, a professional, that this is what they do to help you guide you through it. A little known professional niche, okay? So just be aware of it. But be wary, W-A-R-Y, there's lots of people out there that say they're college planning specialists. So do your diligence and research, check their credentials, their background, before you decide to work with somebody, right? But the key is I want you to realize there's people out there that can help you through it, that do this as a job. So how many here would like to know more about their own personal unique situation? So what I offer, because you sat through this whole presentation, in fact, I did a group meeting with all of you, I offer that you can come see me for free to discuss your unique situation, okay? You simply have to decide if you want to come or not. And we discuss all the free money, what your unique options and opportunities are, you get educated and informed. You don't know anything about me yet, but rest assured, people have gone through it, they can tell you personally. I don't expect you to buy anything at that first meeting. I give you information, take it home, think about, do your research. But just so you know, get educated and informed. If you want to learn more, come see me. All you have to do is in your handout, there's something called, I call it a blue sheet. It's a valuation form. You just simply put it in, put a date, time, phone number, email, hand it to Angie in the back on the way out. And what that means, yes, I want a consultation. That means, yes, please call me as soon as possible. I want to come see you. And I see you in the evenings, and I do Saturdays. For example, I'm available this Saturday. My office is in Princeton. Right? It's actually on Route 1, right around the corner off of Ridge Road. So if you want to come in and see me, just check yes. If you don't want to come see me, just walk right up by Angie. If I can help you down the road, just feel free to reach out to us. Contact us. We'd be happy to help you. So with that, any questions? If you don't have any, it's okay. One thing I'll point out to you poor people in the end, they're already working with me. I don't think they learned anything new by sitting here tonight. And they're nice enough to come in. Did you learn anything new? Okay, good. Okay. All right, fantastic. It's really education information, right? Is that fair to say? <laughs> Very good. 
very good. So what they said in the, in the, in the back in the video is the son came because he missed the first presentation, so it'd be good for him to learn. He had too much homework, he couldn't come. So very good. Any questions, either one of you? If not, you're free to go. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good evening. Hope you come see me. Happy to help you. I won't bite. Okay? Take care.